afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to interacting with many of you over the course uh, of the next three days. I also want to thank Warner Edwards Distillery for, for sponsoring this, this uh, uh, lecture, and also want to thank Roger for, for the introduction. Applying the basics of honeybee biology. Honeybee biology, we could spend the next week talking about basic biology. But the bees need to speak to you. Any time that you go into a hive, you are checking to see if everything is okay or normal, whatever normal might be. And if not, then you as the keeper must come up with a management strategy on how to deal with whatever situation you find. And, but in order to understand what's normal, you really have to understand the topic of bee biology. And of course, the emphasis here today is from a management uh, standpoint. Applying the basics of honey bee biology. Understanding bee biology, as I just said, is the foundation of colony management. You have to know what is normal and what is not normal in order to decide what needs to be done. Honeybees are social insects. Sometimes we refer to the colony as a superorganism because there are individuals within that population in the bees, of the bees that specialize in certain tasks and especially specialize in reproduction. If you just look at solitary insects, the females reproduce. Okay? Here we have the queen who specializes in reproduction of this large population of bees. And they are social in nature, just like termites and ants and some wasps, etc. They live in perennial colonies, which again is very unique to the insect world. Most insects survive the winter by going into a condition we call diapause. Or if you want to think like a bear, we would say hibernation. They become inactive and their metabolic or biological processes slow down almost to zero, but not quite. They remain alive over the course of the winter. But honeybees are able to survive the winter by forming the winter cluster. And they remain active, and the queen typically, soon after uh, the 1st of January, will begin laying a few eggs, and the, the colony will begin uh, reproducing. To be a social insect, there are three basic characteristics associated with sociality. We sometimes refer to it as their eusocial. First of all, there's cooperative brood care. The young of the reproductives then care for future generations of reproductives. There are the reproductive castes, the queen and the drone. And there's an overlap between generations. And this is, are the characteristics associated with being eusocial. This social organization that we're talking about here is under the direction or coordination of chemical signals that actively are produced and transmitted by the bees. And we'll talk more about that uh, in tomorrow's uh, lecture. Each member of the colony has a definite task to perform, but it takes the combined efforts of the entire population of bees in order to survive and reproduce. Sometimes you might stop and think, why is that particular bee doing a certain thing? And if we follow that particular bee over a period of time, we find that their, their tasks change in relation to the development of various 
glandular sources found within the bee. And again, that's, that's tomorrow's uh, a lecture. Individual bees cannot survive by themselves for very long. They must have this population of bees. I wish I could tell you, what is the minimum number of bees that must be present in order for a colony to survive and be productive? We don't know what that minimum number is, but my gut feeling is it's somewhere around five, 6,000 bees. In order to establish this social structure that we find within the honeybee colony. Colony strength is an important consideration. Michael Smith in his talk this morning talked about how a colony will begin producing drone comb. The larger the colony, the earlier they will begin making that investment in reproduction. Colony strength is also important from the standpoint of survival, in the, from the standpoint of honey production. If you find that you have weak colonies, sometimes we recommend that you combine weak colonies to make a stronger colony in the springtime using the newspaper technique as is shown here in this particular uh, photograph. Small weak colonies are unable to establish the social structure and maintain conditions for colony development. So bigger is better. That's the key uh, that we want to keep in mind today. Bigger is better, and we'll talk more about that throughout the week. You must have the minimum number of bees to maintain brood nest temperature. And ideally, if there's reproduction going on, if there's egg laying going on, the brood nest temperature must be between 93 and 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That takes bees, a lot of bees, to, to keep the temperature that, regardless of what the temperature is outside of the hive. Each larva, during its six day period of time, must receive somewhere between two to 3,000 nurse bee visits. So you must have a large nurse bee population in, in each colony as well as a large field force. So success in beekeeping is through your management and your ability to develop strong productive colonies. Roger and I have communicated back and forth, and he tells me that you do not develop as, as strong a colonies as we do in the States, but the idea is bigger is better, and your most productive colonies are likely to be your strongest uh, colonies. In the States, this is what we, we uh, preach as we uh, are, are studying the bees. Uh, what is a productive colony? Ideally, we'd like to have between 40 and 60,000 workers, a large nurse bee population, an excellent queen laying to her capacity, and low stress conditions. These are what we want to see in a productive colony. Even if you have those conditions, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be a productive colony because it's dependent upon the floral sources of the area, it's dependent upon the temperature and, and the environment of the area at that particular time. But you want to be ready. So when conditions are right, the bees are able to take advantage of the local uh, nectar flows. Another important consideration is the fecundity of the queen and how it relates to the development of the colony. As I said, since the most populous colonies will produce the most honey. Until this colony strength approaches 10 frames of bees, the queen is unable to lay to her capacity. And so number of combs covered with bees is an indication of colony strength. Even though your equipment is of different size, your combs are of are of different size 
compared to what we use in the States, the same concept is true. There has to be a large population of bees providing conditions that will allow a colony to develop to their capacity. The number of eggs that's laid by the queen is dependent upon her quality. And on Saturday, Roger and I are going to uh, talk about queen quality and how we have problems both in the states as, as well as over here in the quality of our queens. It's the number of eggs that she lays is going to be dependent upon the size of the nurse bee population. And how much open space or open comb do you provide her in order for her to lay eggs in? And the quantity and the quality of the royal jelly that she's fed will determine how many eggs that she is able to lay. Again, we'll delve into that deeper uh, come Saturday. You as a beekeeper are going to evaluate your queens on the basis of colony characteristics. And the most important one in evaluating a queen is the brood pattern that she is laying. But also, you ought, need to consider the behavior of the queen on the comb as you open up your hive and you begin to examine the brood nest. Even though the colony is open, does she keep laying eggs and go on just as though nothing is happening? Or is she a very nervous queen and does she, she run around a great deal when you disturb the colony? That's a consideration. The temperament of the workers is another consideration in relation to the, the quality of the queen. I'll be the first to admit some of my most productive colonies are my most defensive or aggressive colonies but it gets to a point where it's just not worth it. And she needs to be replaced. And you have to make that decision. Also, you're going to look at the production records of this particular colony. Their, their inclination to swarm. How much honey do they produce? Did they survive the winter, etc.? These are all things that you're going to use in evaluating the queen. But her brood pattern is the most important. Now just look at that lovely lady there. Is she a good queen? Can you tell by looking at her if she's a good queen or not? No, not really. As I said, what's most important is the brood pattern that she is laying. This particular slide was taken early in the spring. It's a small patch of cat brood, but it's a good solid patch of brood and we would have to conclude, given the, the time of year, the current conditions, that that colony is headed up by an excellent queen. But when you run across a situation like this, which we call a scattered brood pattern, that may be an indication of a poor queen. But there are many other factors that can give you a spotty brood pattern as well. It may be genetic. It may be that the queen has mated with drones that are closely related to her and carry the same sex allele. And as a result, you end up with a, with a spotty brood pattern. That's another whole lecture in itself. All right. Any break in a broodering cycle due to mites, due to diseases, due to uh, an insecticide exposure or whatever it might be may give you a, a spotty brood pattern. What's the take home message? If you see a spotty brood pattern, that tells you you need to keep monitoring that queen and make a decision over time whether she needs to be replaced or not. Virtually all bee activities are directly stimulated and coordinated to a large degree by a chemical that we call pheromones, or chemicals, I should say, that we call pheromones. What is a pheromone? It's a chemical substance or a blend of substances secreted by the bee to the outside of his or her body 
that affects the behavior and the physiology of other bees within that particular colony or affects other bees within another colony if they happen to come in contact with the other. So it's a chemical produced by glands within the bee secreted to the outer surface of the bee and it causes effects on other bees. A good example would be an alarm pheromone. All right, they release an alarm pheromone, several of the bees go on the defensive and to protect their colony and to protect uh, their hive. There are two subclasses of pheromones. There are releasers and there are primers. <clears throat> Release pheromones cause an immediate behavioral response, or almost immediate, within a matter of a few seconds, or maybe a minute or two. Short period of time. As I said, alarm pheromones is an excellent example uh, of a releaser pheromone. Another good example is that of the Nasinoff gland, or the, of the scent gland. We call it Nasinoff pheromone. <clears throat> it's released anytime that there's, the bees are, are uh, disorganized. <clears throat> You've done something that's caused them to become disorganized, and so the bees will raise, the workers will raise their abdomen, expose the nasinoff gland, or, or you may call it the scent gland, and release this chemical to kind of calm things down, get everybody back uh, on, on the right uh, behavior. Primer pheromones may take a week, may take two weeks to have an effect. In other words, if you come, if I'm a bee and I come in contact with a primer pheromone, something about my physiology, something about my behavior, or something about the genes that are being expressed at a particular time in my life are going to be altered, changed. And this is how bees then move from one task to another as, as the age. Uh, so it has an effect on the endocrine system, it has an effect on the uh, reproductive system, it changes that individual's behavior, but it takes time. Most pheromones are complex mixtures of several different chemicals. Over 50 different chemicals have been identified within the honeybee colony being produced by brood, being produced by drones, being produced by the queen or the workers. Back when I took my first beekeeping class, my major professor said, drones do not pr produce pheromones. But since it's been shown that they do, they produce a pheromone that's involved in drone congregation areas during mating behavior. So all of the casts and all of the stages a brood are effective in um, producing uh, pheromones. Different components within a pheromone, which we call a pheromone, they may act simultaneously together to cause a change in, in bee behavior, or they may act singly and one component causes something to happen, another component causes something else to happen. Uh, and a good, good examples of this is what we call brood pheromone. There's a certain chemical that causes that cell to be capped once uh, the larval stage uh, has been completed. Some of those chemicals are involved in getting food from the nurse bees and the right type of food for that particular cast in their development. So they work either together or they may work uh, separately. Pheromones, as we said, are secreted to the exterior of the body as a liquid, but then they may be transmitted as a gas or a liquid. One of the hypotheses that Michael talked about this morning was volatile pheromones. Well, those would be in the gaseous form. And he would had them uh, 
caged below the, the, the part of the, the colony or the hive where he was taking his measurements in relation to drone comb production. As we said, over 50 different chemicals have been derived from the queen, the workers, and immatures. This, today, because, as I said, this is a huge topic and we can't spend a lot of time on it, we're going to specifically talk about pheromones associated with the queen. Some of you, and I heard somebody mention it in one of the questions they asked this morning, they, they referred to it as queen substance. I'm just going to call it queen pheromone or her, her chemical profile because she has several glands that produce uh, pheromone. She is responsible for regulating the social organization and the division of labor within the worker caste. Who is responsible for doing what when? It's partly related to the pheromones that are produced by the queen. As I said, she has multiple glands that produce pheromones. She has mandibular glands, which is her jaw. She has turgal glands, which is the dorsal surface of her abdomen. She has Dufour's gland, Koshkinoff gland. These are associated with the queen's sting apparatus, as well as tarsal glands. Maybe you've heard the phrase footprint pheromone. As the queen walks across the comb, glands within her feet, or tarsi as they're called, secrete pheromone and it's absorbed by the wax. The queen's chemical profile or pheromone profile changes over time. The types of pheromones she produces and the quantities of chemicals differ significantly between virgin queens and mated queens, and we could even add the second step between young mated queens and older mated queens. There is a difference in her profile. Since a queen cannot interact with all the members of her colony, she basically is interacting with the retinue of workers or that cord of workers that surround her, and we'll, we'll explain how in just a minute. But every worker within that hive knows one, they have a queen. Two, they know how good she is just on the basis of the pheromones that she's producing and are being distributed uh, within the hive. This court, this retinue of workers that surround her, they care for her. There are actually nine different chemicals associated with the formation of the retinue of the court. Some of those of the nine come from her mandibular glands and some come from her turgo glands as I indicated to you that are located on the dorsal surface of her abdomen. This shows a queen surrounded by these workers. As we say, we call it the retinue or her court and they're responsible for feeding her, they're responsible for grooming her, they're responsible for removing her waste, but more importantly, they're responsible for licking pheromone from her body and passing it through the population of bees. We have two types of behaviors associated with the bees that make up the retinue that surround her. We have what we call lickers, and we have also antennators. In other words, they are touching her with their antenna. All right? Think of the antenna of the bee as being a, something like our noses. Now, there are many different types of sensilla on her, on the the antenna for different, sensing different things. But just think of it as being uh, their nose, so to speak. So lickers touch the queen with their tongues, their forelegs, and their mouth parts. The antenators, as I indicated, brush her body surface with their antenna. 
And this is how her pheromones are distributed through the population of bees. Only about 10% of the, of the bees of, are lickers, but they pick up over half of the queen's pheromones. And here on this particular slide, we see a worker bee licking the dorsal surface of the queen's abdomen. And so this would be an example of a licker bee. Now, there's a behavior in social insects that is very, very important in the coordination and the social structure of the honeybee population. It's called trophallaxis. Trophallaxis is the distribution of food or pheromones from one individual to another. And here we see two bees with their mouth parts touching each other and one of the bees is passing either a pheromone or food to the other bee. And this is how the pheromone then is distributed in the population. If I put a queen in the colony and I brushed radioactive pheromone on her body, in about 20 minutes or so, radioactivity would have been entirely spread throughout that population of, of bees. And that's how the pheromone is spread. And that's how every member of the, of the society knows they have a queen and the quality of her queen, depending upon the blend of pheromone they're receiving and how much pheromone they are receiving. Both the heads and the abdomens of the queen are the areas that receive the most attention. Why? Because as I already told you, that is where the glands are located. The wax comb also acts as a sponge and absorbs some of this. So as the, as the chemical is being spread through the population of bees, some of it is lost because it's being absorbed by the, the, the comb. Some of it is being consumed. We don't know what effect consuming pheromone has on that individual's uh, behavior, that individual's physiology, but they do absorb some of it uh, or swallow some of it uh, even though they don't have a swallowing mechanism like we do, but just to give you the idea of what is actually uh, going on. Um, I said we were going to talk about one specific effect of queen pheromone in relation to the biology of the colony and to you as the manager, okay? And I'm going to call, just call it queen substance, but it's her, her pheromone coming from several different glands, primarily from the mandibular glands. Queen substance inhibits ovary development in workers. You know, if we talk about the population of bees, we have a queen, occasionally in multiple queens, but we have a queen, and we the workers are females, but we refer to them as sterile females. And the reason they're sterile is because the queen is producing queen mandibular pheromone that keeps them, keeps their ovaries from developing. And so that we call them sterile uh, females. Another important effect of queen substance or queen pheromone is that it inhibits the production of queen cells. She's going to remain in charge. She's going to remain the queen of the hive, so to speak, because her chemicals keep the workers from producing other queens. This is where we're going to concentrate on today. Queen pheromone has many other functions. It attracts drones during the mating flight. It affects foraging behavior uh, of, the, of the workers. It has many, many different effects that we don't have time to talk about today. But the one that we're going to spend our time on is it inhibits the production of queen cells. 
This is not entirely controlled uh, by the mandibular gland. More recent research uh, has shown that secretions from the turgo glands also are involved in keeping the worker ovaries from developing. And also, brood pheromone will keep the worker's ovaries from developing. So we're, I went back, I, I, even though I misspoke, went back to the idea that they keep, they inhibit the, the ovaries of the workers from developing. And it comes from two different glandular sources, the turgular glands and the uh, mandibular glands. All right, now, so when you go into a hive and you're checking on its condition and deciding what you must do, if you see any queen cells, that tells you something is going on. You're not supposed to see queen cells. All right? So th that's your first clue that something has gone awry. Now you as the beekeeper, you have to decide why are they producing queens? And secondly, what should you do about it? Queens are produced under three, three different conditions. There are emergency queen cells, there are supersedure queen cells, and there are what we call swarm queen cells, part of the preparation for swarming. Under each of these three conditions, there are typical characteristics that you need to use in deciding what is going on in this particular hive. Why are they producing queen cells? You're going to consider the number of queen cells being produced and you're going to consider the location within the brood nest of where they are being produced. Emergency queen rearing begins within hours of queen loss. It happens very rapidly in a matter of 30 minutes to an hour. All right, maybe the queen died. Maybe you were examining a comb and she accidentally fell onto the grass and did not find her way back. Maybe she has a disease and dies. Maybe as you were removing combs from the brood nest, you accidentally squashed her and killed her. She was there, she was doing just fine, and boom, she's no longer present. And the bees respond by producing what we call emergency queen cells. So it happens fairly quickly after the loss of the queen. Supersedure is a gradual process over time. Swarming preparations is a gradual process over time. Emergency happens very, very rapidly. What I want you to remember is the highest quality queens are produced under the supersedure or the swarming impulse. Your poorest queens are produced under the emergency conditions. Okay? So this is part of the reason why it's important for you to figure out why are they producing queens and whether or not you're likely to end up with a good queen or a pitiful queen that needs to be replaced. So you need to decide why. This queen quality associated with queen rearing is related to the age of the larvae that they select to produce a new queen. And it's related to her nutrition over the time that she's in the larval stage developing within the queen cell. This brings up an important question for I want you to think about for a, for a moment. In an emergency, in order for that colony to survive, 
it's very, very important that they produce a new queen as soon as they possibly can. My question to you is what is the shortest period of time from the time of queen loss until there can be a new queen chewing her way out of the queen cell? What is the shortest period of time? Now let me just help you along a little bit. How long does it typically take from a time an egg is laid until a queen emerges? 16 days. 16 days. Good group. You're right on the ball. 16 days. Now my question is, what's the shortest period of time that can happen before a new queen emerges? I heard 12, 15, I heard 10. We have a winner. 10 is the right answer. Now you're saying, how can that be? Egg is laid. The egg is in the egg stage for three days. It hatches, and then it goes into the larval stage, which lasts five and a half days. They can select a, a larva that is three days old and produce a queen. I didn't say a good queen. I said a queen. All right? Three days in the egg stage, three-day-old larvae, that's six. Six minus 16 leaves you 10 days. So they could have a new queen within 10 days. But because they selected a three-day-old queen, because her nutrition was limited during her development, she is likely to be a poor queen. All right. Let's, let's look at this a little bit more in relation to the basic biology of the hive and the pheromone distribution to figure out how do the bees determine when they need to raise emergency queens. All right, the queen was there. Boom, she's gone. We had queen pheromone present at a level that kept the bees from raising a new queen. Okay? Now she's gone. Now there's no queen pheromone present. And so they go to town to start producing uh, several queen cells. Because it's an emergency, they select older larvae, up to possibly three days old, and they modify a worker cell. You see, any fertilized egg can potentially become a queen. It has to do with nutrition, it has to do with the size and the orientation of the cell. Well, workers are raised in comb with a horizontal orientation. Queens are raised in a vertical orientation. So they take a worker cell, select what we would call a worker larvae, even though, as I say, potentially they can become either and they modify that cell into a peanut-shaped cell right on the comb surface. Uh, so it's a modified uh, worker cell, and in an emergency situation, they may produce up to 20 cells. In the case of supersedure in relation to pheromones, as a queen ages, she likely produces less queen substance. And it will, her level of production may very well drop below the threshold that's been inhibiting them from raising new queens. It's like they got an email. Hey, it's time to start raising queens because that, the chemical is below that threshold. And so they, they set about to raise uh, new queens. Again, supersedure queen cells are typically found on the comb surface. All right, there's a queen cell. It's on the comb surface. Your question, is it an emergency queen cell or is it a supersedure queen cell? What? Emergency. emergency. All right. I'll go along with that. It probably is an emergency. But the only way you can know for sure in an emergency after this 
queen cell is there and capped, there should be no young larvae present because the queen disappeared, she no longer laid eggs, and so you're certainly not going to see eggs and you may not see some young larvae. So that's how the best way for you to determine is it an emergency queen cell or is it a supersedure queen cell. See a supersedure queen cell, the queen is still present even though she's not chemically producing very good, so to speak, and she's still laying some eggs and she's still and there, so you should find eggs in all stages uh, of larvae. So that's how you're going to distinguish between them. Now, why do they produce queen cells when they're preparing to swarm? There are a couple of factors that are believed to be involved. The level of queen substance is low and it's not efficiently being distributed within the hive because of congestion in the brood nest. Not all bees are receiving enough of her pheromone to keep them from raising new queens. So some of the population gets the message, the chemical message. They need to start raising queens, but it's due to congestion and it's due to inefficient distribution of her chemicals. She's also pr probably producing a level that's just above what normally would inhibit them from, from raising uh, new queens. A colony, and this has to do with age, a colony that is headed up by a two-year-old queen is more than twice as likely to swarm as a colony headed up by a one-year-old queen. So it's partly related to her, her pheromone production and her age. Generally older queens produce less queen substance and as I say due to congestion, due to a huge population of bees, it's just not being adequately efficiently distributed within the hive. Congestion is the primary factor that initiates swarming and if we were talking about swarming biology today, that would be our first major point that we would make you, with you. Congestion interferes with the distribution of her pheromones and it stimulates queen cup building. Here's a frame from a colony that is preparing to swarm. Typically in the swarm preparations they produce them near the bottom. We have queen cells here. We have queen cells here. This is more the typical of when they're preparing to swarm and we have numerous queen cells here. Lots of queen cells generally located near the bottom of the comb. And as I say, this is a result of possibly low production on her part or inefficient distribution on the, because of congestion. I said that congestion stimulates the production of a queen cup. And for individuals in here that have, haven't been keeping bees for a long time, the first thing you need to do is to be able to distinguish between a queen cup and a queen cell. This is a queen cup. This is a queen cell where the queen has just recently uh, emerged. You will find queen cups in a hive year round, more in the spring than any other time of year, but they're always there. And you can take your hive tool and you can cut them out and they'll put them, build them right back. Okay? Maybe in a different location, but they'll build them, build them right back. But you have to be able to distinguish between what is a cup and what is a queen cell in order to make the right management decisions. And as I say, just finding a queen cup without an egg, without a larvae, you don't need to be concerned. Okay, just keep right on going. Here's another shot. As I say, queen cups are a normal part of colony development and you see a couple of bars there where there are numerous queen cups. You don't need to be concerned as, as the manager. All right, another interesting question for you to think about. The queen produces pheromone. The lickers and the antennators lick it from her body. They distribute it through the population. 
some of that pheromone comes back to the queen as they're feeding her and caring for her. All right, now, what stimulates a queen to go out and to lay in a queen cup? This is a feedback mechanism. Michael in his lecture this morning talked about a feedback mechanism. This is a common th thing that happens within biology. So what we're, what we're hypothesizing, what we're suggesting is happening is she produces pheromone, it passes through the population, it returns to her. And as long as there's lots of it coming back to her, she doesn't seek out queen cups and lay eggs. But when it drops below a certain threshold, that's her chemical signal or, or message that it's time to go find queen cups and begin laying eggs, so to speak. Okay, this is what we believe is happening uh, within the hive. I already mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. There are three important components to a productive hive. You must have a good queen, you must have a large nurse bee population, and you must have a large field force. So you as the manager, you as the beekeeper, need to keep conditions that will allow that queen to lay at a maximum rate at the time when your colony is building and you're getting ready for the upcoming uh, foraging season. So that's part of your management. You're providing plenty of brood comb for her to lay in. You're providing plenty of nurse bees as well as worker bees in order to uh, provide the necessary components of, of survival and productivity. Now, do I have any procrastinators in here? Any procrastinators? Yeah, you're looking at the king of procrastination right here. All right, now, as a manager, I'm suggesting to you you need to be sure that I, there are ideal conditions from a nutritional standpoint, from a comb standpoint, etc., present in the hive in order to get this colony to build rapidly six weeks before you need a peak population. We don't tend to think six weeks in advance, do we? Why six weeks? if we want to have a maximum field force available to go to the field? Well, the first three weeks, the bee develops. Okay? The next two to three weeks, they are house bees. They're not going to, so it's basically going to be six weeks before they're ready to go to the field. So you've got to provide conditions that will allow to the queen to reproduce at our maximum rate a minimum of six weeks before you need to have that peak population available to go to the field. There is a basic relationship between brood and adult population that determines the rate and growth of colony development. As the colony population increases, the efficiency of the colony improves. Your strongest colonies produce the most honey per bee. As the colony population increases, a smaller proportion of bees are needed for broodering, which gives you then a larger field force. This is some data that was generated many years ago. 10,000 bees can produce 8,500 cells of brood, or the ratio uh, to brood to adult bees is 0.85. 30,000, they can raise up to 18,300 cells of brood, but the ratio drops to 0.61. See, this is what's good. As the size of the population increases, a larger proportion of the bees are available to go to the field. Or you can think of it just the opposite. 
as the population increases, a smaller proportion of the bees are required to be nurse bees and to maintain brood nest temperature. We could spend a lot of time on this, but I don't have that kind of time, so we'll just let it go at that. A large colony produces more brood than a small colony, yet has a higher proportion of its bees available for gathering nectar and pollen. Let me just go back. I want you to think of it this way, and then I'm not saying this is the way it is. I'm not saying this is the way it is. But just say when the ratio of bees, brood to adult bees is 0.75, I want you to think about that means that 75% um, of the population is required to raise brood and maintain brood nest temperature, and 25% is available to go to the field. But we look here at 50,000 bees, now only 38% of the population is available for broodering, etc., and the balance is available to go to the field. I've gotten my five minute warning, so that means I've got to start winding down here. Okay, here's another study that basically says the same thing. As the population increases, so does the size of the foraging force. All right, if the nutritional condition of a colony is lacking, you may have to feed either a pollen supplement or a pollen substitute to provide the ideal conditions for either preparing the bees to go into the winter which I'm going to talk more about later in the week, or providing adequate nutrition for the colony to develop as rapidly as possible. And there are many different formulations of pollen supplements uh, on the market. You may choose, uh, or pollen substitutes on the market, you may choose to do, use a pollen supplement where you trap some pollen and, and then make patties as you see here and feed, it, feed them back to the bees. This whole idea is also very important when you introduce a foreign queen. A foreign queen smells differently than the queen that was there, so she needs to be protected when you introduce this new queen to the colony, and it all is related to her pheromone profile. And let me just finish up by saying, understanding and applying bee biology will assist you in developing strong colonies, dealing with swarm management, which I really didn't talk about today. It will help you when you requeen colonies or introduce a new queen to a colony, and it will help you in evaluating uh, the queen. But the take home message is, when you see a colony raising queens, that needs to tell you something's not right and you need to figure out what's going on, and more importantly, why is it going on, and what should you do about it. Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, with the, um, the liquors that are 10% of the hive, <coughs> in other lectures that I've been to, they talk about honeybee democracy and the select group of worker bees within the hive that then perhaps determine when we swarm and all that sort of, when they swarm and that sort of thing. Is that the same 10%? The answer is no. It is not the same 10%. So they're not and, a, and I'm not even... A higher group. I'm not 100% convinced that that 10% figure is necessarily right. right. Okay? I would need to spend some more time reviewing studies and things and to determine if it is or not, but I don't think that, I don't think that figure is necessarily right. Thank you. Um, you said there's about 50 pheromones have been isolated so far. Do you think that's only the start? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure, you know, 50 years from now we might know of 100. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that there's sort of synergistic uh, relationships between one pheromone and another which would have different effects? In, in some instances there are synergistic relationships. For those of you who don't know what, what we're saying here is there's an additive effect. A combination of two or more may cause things to happen faster and, and, and change behavior in, in, a, in a higher manner than if just as single 
components not mixed together. Yeah. We've only touched the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, in understanding pheromone biology and pheromone production and the effects that the various chemical components have uh, on bee behavior and bee physiology, bee development, uh, the expression of genes, etc. Uh, the, the developing the, the bee's genome was just the beginning of starting to understand some of this, of when, when certain genes are functioning and why they're functioning and what are the conditions necessary for them to, to be expressing themselves. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, hi, you mentioned that um, in colony size, the bigger, the bigger the better, and you showed a chart that showed that larger colonies are disproportionately more productive in terms of foraging and the, therefore honey production. I'm wondering if there's, you get to a point where there are decreasing returns to scale. For example, in um, either honey production or in terms of just having to lift all those boxes, being able to treat with oxalic acid because the vapor doesn't, you know, um, go through the entire hive, um, or, or for any other reason. Do you get to a point of 60, 70,000 bees, which might be two or three deeps, that it's just unproductive to go beyond? Yes. Well, in fact, I think when you get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the figure 60,000, okay? When you reach that point, then I think the social organization of the hive disintegrates. Uh, there's a loss of um, productivity, et cetera. Uh, two things I can think of. Swarming in the spring of the year would be an example of where it's not good. But more importantly, swarming in the fall of the year. And that does happen. Um, and we don't understand it. Why? Because in the northern um, climates, a, a colony that swarms in the fall probably has something close to zero per chance of, of survival. Okay? Why would they do that? Well, we believe it's a form of population control. They got too big. Hi, I have a question. Did you uh, hear the previous uh, lecture of uh, Michael Smith? Yes, I did. Uh, well, he dismissed pheromones uh, and he co concentrated on um, density, uh, but we know that each queen has its own pheromones and families uh, can distinguish uh, that the pheromone comes from a foreign family. So um, would, you, would you go the same way? Would you, would you, dis would you uh, give one family uh, pheromones from another, from another queen? and uh, believe it will, uh, di you know what I mean? Yes, a and I would dismiss it as well because there is no evidence that I'm aware of of pheromone or the queen's pheromone having a any effect on comb building. And he was specifically looking at drone comb building. And so I would have to dismiss it at this point in time. So there may be chemicals involved but we probably haven't identified them yet and shown that, that they affect uh, comb building behavior. So I would, I would, his evidence or his research would s support that, that uh, he dismissed it. And as I say, at this point in time, I would have to dismiss it as well. I understand. <laughs>